evening. And let's turn to Exodus chapter number 5. And then, uh, Tiffany, that handout you have, Tiffany made that. And so it would be really handy as we go through the ten plagues this evening just to kind of follow along. And I can't, my hillbilly accent, I can't pronounce those Egypt God names. I don't really care to anyway. But uh, so it would be helpful now as we kind of go through it. So uh, as you turn to Exodus chapter number 5, last week we talked about how it was Brother Jonathan's idea back in January, February-ish to go through some of the lessons that will be taught in VBS on Wednesday evening. So I think it's a great idea. So last week we talked about the burning bush and you know God calling Moses. And so t- tonight we're going to talk about the second night of VBS. And the lesson is called Rescued by God. And it's, just a, uh, it's, it's called A Look at God's Gracious Glory. And each night there, there's a different aspect of God's glory that's explored. And the lesson is just based on God delivering His people out of Egypt. And so this is, I really learned a lot studying for this tonight. And I'll, I will say everything that here I've just taken from different sources. And it was, it was, I enjoyed it. I, I, there's a lot that I learned. The memory verse for the first evening, even, every evening has a key verse or memory verse. The, first, or the second evening it's Psalm 18.3. Uh, I'll read this verse and then we'll pray and then get started. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and ask God's blessing on His Word tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You again for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we thank You for every home represented here. And Lord, we just thank You for their faithfulness to continue to attend church. And God, I pray for each and every one of us that are members here, God, that You just give us a, a, a patience, Lord, as we wait on You to send the right man of God here for us. God, I pray that You bless Your Word tonight. And uh, Lord, just help us as we... Uh, dive in and, 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 and see the miracles and, and, and look at what a great and mighty and wonderful God that it is that we have and serve. And God, I pray that you just give me the words to speak, give me the boldness and, and the utterance, and, and we'll give you the glory and praise for it. Pray in Jesus' name and, and amen. All right, so uh, let's, we jumped in here at, at uh, Exodus chapter number 5. Last week we talked about the burning bush and uh, God called Moses uh, to be uh, the spokesman. Uh, for him to pull the people out. And so when we pick up this week, we look in Exodus 20, uh, chapter 4, and verse number 29. So uh, we pick the story up here. Moses and Aaron uh, are gathered together with all the elders of Israel at this point. And so uh, Aaron speaks to them. Uh, he, he shows them the signs that God had showed Moses. And they believed here. And it says that they worshiped in verse number 31. And so uh, then when we jump over here in chapter number 5, right in verse 1, uh, Aaron and Moses pay their first visit to Pharaoh. And, with, and uh, look in verse number 2 here with me in Exodus 5, verse number 2. And, and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So don't get off to a good start. We know this. God tells Moses this is going to happen. Right? You know, Pharaoh's about to quickly learn who God is, right? You know, Hebrews 10 31 says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And Galatians 6 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. You're going to reap what you sow, and he's about to here in a minute. So we look in verse number 3 here. And Moses asked for the Israelites to be allowed to go three days' journey into the desert, into the wilderness, to sacrifice to the Lord. And Pharaoh obviously says, No, we know the story. And then it tells us in verses 4 through 8 that he makes it way harder on, on the Israelites. They're already under bondage, they're in slave labor, and now he's going to make it even harder on God's people here. Now let's skip down to chapter number 6. And in ch- chapter number 6, in verse number 1, God essentially tells Moses here, he says, just stand back and watch what's about to happen. Watch what I'm about to do. Read it with me here. Here's Exodus chapter 6, verse number 1. Then the, then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Now skip down with me to uh, to the end of the passage here, to verse number 28. We're still in chapter number 6. And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto him. And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, 
And how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? Now, here's, this is where we're going to get into the meat of the lesson. When you look in verse number 1, Moses says something interesting here. Look in, verse, in, in chapter 7, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. See, in, in the Egyptian culture, the Pharaoh was considered a god. He was a god to them, and they were considered to be literal sons of Ra, the sun god, and they were considered to be gods on earth. They were The pharaohs were essentially, to the Egyptians, embodied all of their gods that they worshipped. That was like the physical embodiment of it. And so they saw him as a god. And, and on your sheet there, I put that the, that the Egyptians worshipped as many as 2,000 different pagan gods and goddesses. And Pharaoh, so when, when, they, when Moses and Aaron come to him and say, you know, the true living God has sent us, Pharaoh's like, okay, great, and we'll just add one more to the list, right? He doesn't see the one true living God that we know as who he really is. Now, he's about to find out, right? But he doesn't see him as that. And you know, in Exodus chapter number 7, verses 4 or 5 here, God tells us why He is going to bring about the plagues and the signs and the wonders about them. Look with me. We're still in chapter 7. Look at verse number 4. And the king of Israel said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses... Uh, hang on, let me go back. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people go from their works? Get you unto the... I'm in the wrong chapter, y'all. Hang on. No wonder. Look, and then this... Is this cut now? Uh, that's what's bothering me. All right. We'll see what we got. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the right chapter now. I'm in chapter number 7, verse number 4. Sorry. Uh, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. In verse number 5, And the Egyptians shall know, listen to this, that I am the Lord. When I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So each of these plagues and miracles that God is going to send, or judgments, whatever you want to call them, uh, when, these are, when, when, when God brings these about against Egypt, it's going to be a direct challenge to one or more of their false gods or goddesses that they have. And so God's plan here is, one, to show the Egyptian pe or people who He is. I am the God. There's not 2,000 different gods. I am the God uh, of this world. I'm the Creator. And then He's also showing the Israelites who He is uh, by going through these. So let's jump right into the passage here. We're in, in chapter number 7, and here's verse number 10. So in verse number 10... Uh, Moses and Aaron go, uh, Aaron go back to Pharaoh. And this is where Aaron throws his rod down and it turns in to a snake, right? And when Aaron casts it down, uh, we notice in verse number 12 that it consumes the other snakes. So they have the ability, Pharaoh's magicians have the ability to turn their rods into snakes. But when you notice, uh, the, Aaron's snake consumes their snakes. If this was a challenge to the snake god. You can see the name on your sheet there, Nehebaku or something. Uh, he was considered a protective deity. According to, and, and according to Egyptian mythology, he swallowed seven cobras. This is why God allowed this one to swallow theirs. In their mythology, he swallowed seven cobras and it gave him power against any magic. And, and not only that, but he was their main god of the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that this snake god would reunite their soul with their body one day in the afterlife. And so uh, they had several snake gods that they worshipped. And the, the pharaohs even wore snake headdresses, like you see like King Tut and all that. You know, they wore snake headdresses as a source of, or a symbol of, of power to them. So when the Hebrew snake consumes all these Egyptian snakes in the name of the God of Israel, that would display very quickly up front that God is supreme, right? There's only one true living God. And you know not only that, but Moses' rod was the rod of power or the rod of God. Aaron's rod was considered the rod of life because it was the priest's rod. You know what? The Egyptians' rods, you know, those serpents were a symbol of Satan and his power of death. But you know what? 1 Corinthians 15.54 says that in resurrection, death will be swallowed up in victory. And so there was victory over Satan in this area. And right off the bat, 
he, he's challenging this snake god that they believed created eternal life. And God's like, mm-mm, no, no, sir. So let's keep going. So the first plague happens here on down in chapter 7, verse number 14. It's in verses 14 through 25. And it's the, the plague where the waters turn to blood. You know, the Nile River was a source of fresh water and food. You know, it was the, the food plains of the Nile were like what they were called the bread basket because it was a real fertile area because it would flood every year. Uh, they would travel on the river. It was this, the, the Nile River was real essential to their, to their culture. And the plague uh, of the water turning to blood challenged Osiris, the chief god of the Nile. And the Egyptians thought that Osiris gave life to the Egyptian empire. And in verse number 21, you know, we, uh, when the Nile River turned to literal blood, you know, this source of what they considered as the source of life became a source of just widespread death and suffering. You know, in verse number 22, it's important to note that even though Pharaoh's magicians were able to replicate the plague, they couldn't stop it. They couldn't reverse it. You know, Satan has no power uh, over, over God's, what God does. Satan can't reverse anything that God does. What God does is final. Satan only has power over death. And, you know, and I believe that their power came from Satan. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 9, speaking of the Antichrist, that even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, Satan has the power to do some of those things, to, to confound people and lead people astray. And I believe that this is where these guys, when the Bible says they have the power to do that, I believe it, and I believe that it came from Satan. But you know what? Each one of these false gods and goddesses that they worshipped was attached to devil. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 19, this is Paul talking. He says, What say I then that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Listen to what, what Paul says in verse number 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You know, the devil doesn't have the power to reverse anything that God does. The devil is a created being just like me and just like you. You know what? And the creation has no power over the creator. Uh, and then if we notice down in verse number 25, this plague lasted for a week. So every source of water that they had was blood for a straight week. God probably started with this plague because if you go back, hold your spot here and go back with me to Exodus chapter number 1. And look at verse number 22. God probably started with attacking the Nile River because back in Exodus chapter number 1, after Joseph was gone on the scene, and, the, and you remember the Israelites were growing uh, exponentially, and he got nervous that, that they were going to take over the Egyptian empire. So they ordered the midwives to kill the, 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 the babies, and the, and the Israelite midwives would not kill them. So then when we get to the end of chapter 1, then Pharaoh tells the Egyptians to just throw them in the Nile. And so when you look here in verse number 22, Exodus 1, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So, you know, I believe God started with this plague because he, he's like, You know what, if you want the blood of Israelite babies, we're going to give you blood to drink. And so I believe that this is God's judgment for the, the, the innocent life that, the, that Pharaohs had shed of those Israelite baby boys. And so, you know, people got to understand that, that our God is a just God, and judgment is coming at some point. And God showed that to the, to the Egyptians here. So the second plague we see is in chapter number 8, and it's in verses 1 through 15. And it was a direct challenge to the Egyptian god Heket or Hek. I saw it spelled both ways. And by the ways we're talking through these, there was tons and tons and tons when you were doing research of gods and goddesses that, that, that this attack. God wasn't just attacking one. This was just like the main one that I'm listing. There were several that God went after. The frog was considered a, uh, sacred to the Egyptians because it lived in two worlds. It lived in the water and on land. And it was so sacred that stepping on one would, could be punished by death. And they're, they're, Now, this is what's ironic. When God brought all these frogs on the land, the, the land was so covered by them that without any doubt, they would have had to step on them and squish them to walk anywhere. Because the Bible tells us it was it, it, the land was covered with them. And here's even something more interesting about the frog plague. The frog uh, goddess here was the goddess of childbirth, midwifery, and resurrection. 
you know, this symbol of childbirth and midwifery uh, that they were throwing into the Nile River was pouring out of the Nile River on them like crazy. And so, you know, this is one more way of God just judging them for what they did to those Israelite babies, boys that they were throwing into the Nile. Because the Bible tells us that these were coming out of the, the river uh, here in the passage. What a nasty plague. Something that they saw as sacred was slimy and stinky. And not only that, but we notice in, in verse number 13 that God didn't make the frogs leave. Notice what he did. He made them die. So this G Egyptian symbol of birth died all over the place. And it stank, it tells us. In verse number 14, it says, And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. So, you know, this is just God's challenge to what they believe created life. You deal with that. Pile up in heaps, and they stank. And again, in verse number 7, it tells us that the magicians were only able to add to their trouble. You know, they couldn't stop it and they couldn't reverse it. They called more frogs, which added to their trouble, but they couldn't stop it and reverse it because only God has the power uh, to control what God does. Now, the third plague we see was, as, and I'm going to try to hurry because uh, I need to get through them all tonight because the evangelists will be covering the next two Wednesdays and we're out the next two Wednesdays. So I want to get through it. So the third plague was lice. The Hebrew word here that was translated for rice, lice, I mean, doesn't necessarily mean that it could have been lice. The translation of the word is as a creature that digs into the skin. And so the closest English word of that was lice. So whatever it was was similar to a lice, and it dug into the skin. It was a challenge to Seb or Geb, the chief god of the earth. And not only that, but it was also directed at these Egyptian priests and magicians. Because these guys went to extreme lengths. They shaved every hair off of their body, including their eyebrows and their, and their eyelashes, because they believed that they couldn't have any, any kind of parasites at all or they couldn't do their pagan worship stuff and they would bathe two, two times a day and two times a night in cold water to stop from having parasites so this was not only an attack uh, on this Egyptian god, uh, god that they worship but it was an attack on those those guys because these lies would have stopped them from doing their religious duties you know the god they worship because that god brought forth fruits and vegetables from the land is now bringing forth lice that bite and so uh, the, the magicians couldn't stop it. They couldn't stop the lice in verse number 18. And in the margin of your Bible, you might want to write down Genesis chapter number 2 next to verse 18. Because Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 7, says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know, not only God can create life from dust. Only God can create life. Life comes from God. You know, and, and, and as a side note to the abortion crowd that where where Roe versus Wade hopefully is going to be overturned maybe this week. You know what? God is the giver of life. And that's an affront to God. You know, even Pharaoh was who was viewed as a god was afflicted afflicted by these lies. Even him and his household was covered in these lies. Uh, and so the next one we see is the fourth plague. It was still here in chapter number 8, verse, verse number 20 uh, through 24. Verse number 24 tells us that it was a grievous swarm of flies. And even Pharaoh suffered along with his people. And, all, and several of the sources that I looked through studying for tonight, uh, that it, it's thought that it was, called, it was a, a fly called the dog fly. It was a blood-sucking fly, or it is a blood-sucking fly with a really painful bite that lives in that part of the world. Then it's similar to like the horse fly that we have around here. And this would have been a challenge to the goddess Hatcock, the wife of Osiris, uh, and, uh, or a couple of their insect goddesses that they have. And, and you know, in Psalm 7, the psalmist discusses this in Psalm 78, 45. It says, he sent diverse sorts of flies among them, and it says, which devoured them. So, I mean, you got a blood-sucking, biting fly, and there were swarms and swarms and swarms of them that just, you know, consumed the people. I couldn't imagine how miserable it would be. I hate when you get one or two flies in the house, right? It drives us nuts. You know, so I couldn't imagine those kind of flies. But also, in verse number 22, it's interesting to note. I, I, I'm not talking way too fast. I'm trying to get through everything. Okay. Uh, I feel like I'm like... Uh, also, it's interesting to note, verse number 22, this is the first plague that God separates His people. And you know, after this plague, starting with this plague and all the remainder plagues, 
none of the God's people, none of the children of Israel suffer along with the Egyptians with any of the plagues uh, from this point on. You know, to know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth is what the Bible says. Okay? So the fifth plague is the plague against the livestock. And this is in chapter number 9, and it starts in verse number 1. This would have been a real costly plague for the Egyptians because it's not, it wasn't just an attack against the cattle. It was against all livestock. If you notice in verse number 3, it says it was against the cattle and the horses and the don donkeys and the camels and the oxen and the sheep. This was an attack against, or this was a, a judgment against all of their livestock. And we see the word moraine there. When you Google the word moraine, it says it's an infectious disease or plague that affects domesticated animals. You know, the cattle were considered sacred to the Egyptians. And this would have really been a challenge to Apis, the bull god. And this is interesting. And this makes a connection to later on in Exodus with the, with the, with the Israelites. They had several cattle deities, but their biggest one, they believe, was the creation god named Pita. And that and Pita, that god, they believe, was represented and manifested in an apis bull. Now, I don't, under, I don't really know how they selected a bull, but this bull was so sacred to them that when it died, they embalmed it and buried it in a tomb like they did one of their pharaohs. And so this was, and when you look, when you read about it, that there's bulls all over everything. And there's some connection, even I remember Brother Jonathan talking that one time, that there's some connection with the bull and all these different pagan religions. Because all these pagan religions, for some reason, worship the, the cow. But, uh, but anyway, this would explain why the molten calf that, that Aaron and the children of Israel made when Moses went up on the Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments and they come back and they've broken the earrings off and melted them down, made that molten calf. You know, it, 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 that molten calf probably resembled what they knew as that apis bull god that they had all over Egypt. You know, and I think it's interesting to note, and it kind of goes without saying, that the Israelites had probably, many of them had probably fallen in to this, to, to worship in pagan gods uh, before Moses showed up on the scene. And it makes sense how quickly they fell back into it. I didn't really kind of make the connection until I was studying for tonight. You know, they fell back into that very quickly. You know, I mean, Moses has gone 40 days on a mountain. And they're already worshiping a, a golden cow. You know, and in my mind, I'm like, how do they do that? But that's what they knew. And that's what they came from. And that makes perfect sense that it would have been a molten calf because this is a big deity that the, that the Egyptians worship. Now, notice in verses 4 and 6 that the cattle, the Israelites, were not affected. So this now would have been, a, not only would it have been a big blow financially, but it would have been a big challenge to their false gods. But think about this. When you go back to Genesis 46 and verse number 34, when Joseph, when, when Jacob was coming to visit and his brothers, uh, and, jo and Joseph's brothers were coming to Israel or to Egypt, Joseph told them not to say anything about being sheep farmers. You know, not, don't, mit, don't say anything about being shepherds because in verse number 34 it says, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. So they see the Israelites as, as an abomination by the way they farm. But you know what? When they look over in Goshen, all the, the Israelites' livestock is healthy and alive, and many of the Egyptians' livestock is dead. So not only would, would, would it have been a financial blow, and it have been a challenge to their gods, but it was also a huge insult uh, to them to get their attention that, you know what? That's not an abomination. All right, so the sixth plague is uh, still here in chapter number 9. It's down in verse number 8. This would have been a crippling plague. Uh, this is not like a little pea-sized hill. I, I, you know, it talked about how people, you know, if, if people and animals and things that didn't have coverage, uh, you know, like shelter, it, they, it killed them. In, uh, oh, sorry, bulls. I'm in the wrong thing. Sorry. Chapter, <laughs> sorry. Exodus 9, verse number 8 is the bull. Sorry, this would have been a crippling plague. Because it tells us in verse number 11 here that they couldn't even stand, the magicians couldn't even stand up uh, to challenge Moses on it, that it was so painful. And the Hebrew word used here for the boil or blains indicated that it would have been like a leprous, pus-filled, open, running sore. I hope you're not planning on eating right after this. Uh, that's what it would have been. <laughs> uh, and so the Egyptians had several healing gods that they worshipped, and their main one was a god named Amhotep. Uh, he was the god of medicine. It would have been a major challenge to him uh, 
And this is really fascinating. In verse number 8 here in the passage, it tells us that to start the plague, Moses took a handful of ashes out of a furnace. Now, the word furnace here in the Hebrew translates as kiln, like brick kiln. So Moses took ashes out of the brick kilns that the Israelites are being forced as slaves to make bricks. Moses takes those same ashes out and he throws them into the air and that's what God used to start this plague. Think about this. Those same brick kilns that the Egyptians used to torment the Israelites, God just turned right back around and used on them again to torment the Egyptians with these nasty uh, bowls and blames that they had all over their body. And notice in verse number 11 that this only affected the, the, the Egyptians. It didn't affect the Israelites over in Goshen. So the seventh plague, sorry, I got ahead of myself while I go, is the, the hell with fire. And that's still in chapter number 9. It's down in verse number 13. And the plague actually happens in verse number 24. This would have been terrifying. Uh, and it says in verse number 23, let me grab it here. Verse number 23 it says, And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent forth thunder and hell, and the fire ran upon the ground, and the Lord rained hell upon the land of, of Egypt. You know, reading some passages, it was probably just really bad lightning. Because in verse 23, it talks about thunderings and, and, uh, and hell. And then you go over to verse number 33 and 34, it talks about rain and thunders. And so it was probably just really bad lightning. I mean, we know lightning can start force fires. We know lightning can burn houses down. We know lightning can, can cause those fires. So it, it, it was probably just a really bad lightning that was like, like running along the ground, which I couldn't imagine how terrifying that would be. Uh, I mean, it could have been fire, but you know, from a lot of all of the things that I read, they all seemed pretty consensus. That it was probably just lightning running along the ground. This plague destroyed everything and everyone that was not protected by shelter. And this was a challenge to shoo the calming god of the atmosphere. Isn't that funny? And Nut, the sky goddess who protected the land from destruction. So think about this for a minute. So the Israelites here, you know, the, 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 the plague that, the, the, the blood plague on the Nile River killed off a lot of the fish, which they ate a lot of fish. So that killed off one source of their food. A lot of their livestock just died off by disease. Uh, and those that weren't killed by the disease, probably the rest of them were probably killed by the hailstorm here, right? Uh, and then look down in verse number 31. In verse number 31 here, it says, And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was an ear, and the flax was boiled. So a lot of their... A lot of their crops were, were destroyed. But in verse number 32, it says, But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they had not grown up yet. So they've lost a lot of their crops here. They've lost a lot of their food sources uh, because of this. But I'll tell you something else that was interesting. If you go back to uh, verse number... Uh, I didn't write it down here. But, uh, yeah, so if you go back uh, to verse number 20... Obviously, a lot of people in Egypt are now starting to believe that maybe God really is the, the true God. Because look, it says here in verse number 20, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into houses. So now they're starting to get it that when Moses says, you know, tomorrow at this time, hell's going to fall, you know, and there's going to be fire with, mixed with it. They're starting to believe him now that maybe this, this man who says he's of the one true living God, maybe he really is of the one true living God. And so maybe he's more powerful than any of the gods that we have. So people in Egypt are starting to believe uh, because of this. Now, the eighth plague is in chapter number 10, and it uh, starts in verse number 12, and it's the plague of locust. And you know, we don't really have really any experience with that here in North America, but apparently plagues of locust are pretty common in the Middle East, and they're pretty common in, in Afri parts of Africa. I didn't know this, but it says a locust is capable of eating its own weight daily. I read this to Tiff earlier. A one square mile swarm will contain roughly 200 million locusts. And there have been swarms recorded as large, listen to this, as 400 square miles. It said it's figured that a swarm this large would contain as roughly up to 80 billion, with a B, 80 billion locusts. I can't fathom that. So I 
Obviously, what God sent on Egypt would have been even larger than something normal, I would think, right? I mean, if, if those are normal locust swarms, imagine what God put on the people of Israel. Well, look down in verse number 15. We're in chapter number 10. Look at verse 15. It says, For they, speaking of the, the locusts, for they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. I can't imagine that. You look outside and everything looks black because there's so many locusts crawling on everything. And all the fruit of the trees, or sorry, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hell had left, and there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. So, I mean, we see here that, you know, this was a challenge to Serapis, the God who protected Egypt, for, was supposed to protect Egypt from, or Serapis, the God who was supposed to protect Egypt from locusts. And it was a challenge to all their crop deities. They had several crop deities that they worshipped. And this was a challenge to every single one of them. So with this plague, anything that was left, including the wheat and the rye that we saw back in chapter number 9, it's gone. So the, 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 whatever that the, the, the hell and fire storm didn't destroy, now the locusts have just destroyed the rest of it. So now there's a serious threat of starvation in the land of Egypt. And that's a testament to how impotent their gods are. And so I think God is really starting to get their attention. Now, look now. We're still in chapter number 10. The ninth plague here was three days of darkness. And that starts in verse number 21. This was a direct challenge to Ra, the sun god. Ra was believed to have had power over all the other gods. And the Egyptians viewed Ra as the creator and giver of life. It seems like they had a lot of those. Uh, but this is really interesting. Verse number 21 says that the darkness could be felt. And in verse number 22, it says it was a thick darkness. So in verse number 23, it would have been crippling. Look at verse number 23 here. Verse number 23 says, They saw not one another, and listen to this, neither rose from any, uh, neither rose, and there's a shadow up here, neither rose any from his place for three days. But the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. So think about that. For three days, it was so crippling that they probably didn't move. They probably just laid or stood or sat where they were at because it was a darkness that could be felt. Now, this, uh, this powerful and, and most worshipped God of the Egyptians was shown very quickly to be powerless. But you know more than that, I think it was a foretaste of hell. Because Matthew twenty two thirteen, Jesus says this. He says, Then said the king to, his, to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a foretaste of the Egyptians. God's given them of what hell's going to be like. There was complete darkness in, in, in Egypt. Egypt was always has been a type throughout the Bible and a picture throughout the Bible as, as, the, as the world or as sin. But over in Goshen in verse number 23, we see that the Egyptians had light in their houses. In fact, it might have even been a nice, beautiful, sunny day over there. Right? The Bible doesn't say that. It just says they had light in their dwellings. Uh, but you know what? That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ right there. And, and God's people had light. You know, it, it, last week we talked about John 8, 12. It says, then Jesus said again to them, I am the light of the world. This is a picture to them uh, of who Jesus is. And then we're down to our last plague here. It starts in chapter 11, and it goes through chapter number 12. But... Chapter 12, verse number 29, is really where the, 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 the plague of the firstborn dying uh, it really is, it happens. So on, the, on April the 14th at midnight, the death angel passed over Egypt, taking the firstborn from all unprotected homes, including the household of Pharaoh himself. His son died. The plague was judgment against Pharaoh and every Egyptian and every god that the Egyptians worshipped. First, uh, chapter 12, verse 12 says, Against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. And so God's telling us here that this is against every single false god that they worship. Taking the firstborn was judgment against them. And not only that, but then Exodus chapter number 12, down to verse number 30, it tells us that there was not a house where there was not one dead in Egypt. So every household had uh, the firstborn die. But praise God, in chapter number 12, God makes a way for His people. Right? God delivered His people by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? You know, and not only that, but in, in verse 
number 13 here, we see that death couldn't get past the blood. It's a great foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to accomplish on the cross. And it's a reminder for us that if, if you're saved, the blood is applied to your life tonight. Death, hell, and the grave no longer have any power over any of us who've accepted Christ as our Savior. God kept His promise to Moses in, in, in Exodus chapter number 3 that we saw last week. And He kept His promise to, to the people of Israel, to the children of Israel in chapters number 4 and 6, that He would bring them out of, out of Egypt. And we see here that they were thrust out of Egypt, that they forced them to leave. You know, we can have confidence in our God because He is the all-powerful Creator of heaven and earth. And we can also have confidence in Him because He's faithful and He's true and He keeps His promises. I hope this is a blessing tonight. I feel like I've talked like a maniac. But we made it through it all, right? And I hope the chart that Tiffany made was a help too. So let's close in prayer. And uh, we'll be done. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your opportunity to be in your house tonight. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, uh, for what a great, mighty, and powerful, and wonderful God that we serve. And God, I pray that it wouldn't be lost on us, that we would be struck with awe and wonder of, of what a mighty God that we serve. And Lord, we thank you here for a picture of, Lord, that what you, Lord Jesus, would eventually come and do, that you would suffer and bleed and die and, and shed your precious blood on the cross of Calvary, that we would have an opportunity uh, to be saved, Lord, that you would free us from sin, just like you freed your people uh, from the Egyptians. And God, I pray if there's one uh, in the sound of my voice that's lost, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you give them an opportunity to accept you before it's too late. I pray that you'd bless all the prayer requests lifted up tonight. And God, I pray that you would just bless this church, give us patience uh, and, uh, as we wait on you. And God, I pray that you keep us safe as we go our separate ways, and we'll be careful to give you the glory for it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, and amen.